In this section, we will discuss the nature and ramifications of the current worldwide economic collapse and how it has been compounded by the gross selfishness and social irresponsibility of the government and corporate powers. Then, more profoundly, we will discuss the role technology is having in displacing workers and the powerful changes this phenomenon is going to force in the world economy at large. 1. Beyond Irresponsibility The collective external debt of all the governments in the world is now about $52 trillion, according to the CIA's World Factbook. Of the roughly 203 countries in the world today, only four do not owe others money. The United States alone has over $12 trillion of this debt as of January 2009, and a study authorized by the U.S. Treasury in 2001 found that in order to keep servicing the debt at its current rate of growth, by 2013, income taxes would need to be raised to 65% of one's income. The whole world is basically bankrupt. But how? How can the world as a whole owe money to itself? Obviously, it's all nonsense. The monetary system is nothing more than a game. Those in positions of social power alter the rules of the game at will. The nature of those rules are guided by the same competitive, distorted mentalities that are used to compete in everyday monetary life. Only this time the game is rigged at its root to favor those who actually run the show. For example, if you have $1 million and put it into a CD at 5% interest, you are going to generate $50,000 a year simply for that deposit. You are making money off of money itself. No invention, no contribution to society, no nothing. That being denoted, if you are a lower or middle class person who is limited in funds and must use credit cards and get interest-based loans to buy your home, then you are paying interest to the bank, which the bank is then turning around and using, in theory, to pay the person's return with the 5% CD. What the bank is basically doing is stealing from the working poor to pay the leisurely rich. Simply put, the social stratification we see in the world today is maintained and guaranteed by the monetary system's underlying mechanisms. That reality aside, let's return to the subject of the so-called business cycle. When money is added to the money supply, that money is then typically put to use for some reason. Very often these reasons include starting a business, buying a home, investing in the stock market, etc. This increase in the money supply often translates into so-called economic growth and hence the boom period of the business cycle. Unfortunately, money cannot be added to the economy indefinitely, for the debt and inflation caused by the expansion will eventually overcome the growth benefits. When problems begin to arise after periods of monetary expansion, such as rising debt levels, slowing people's desire to take on new loans, the central bank and government regulators have basically two choices. They can either, one, attempt to continue the expansion by infusing even more money, often by lowering the interest rates, making credit cheaper, or, two, let the contraction, hence recession, run its course, raise the interest rates, and bring the economy back to some kind of equilibrium. As far as history is concerned, the pattern has been for them to do both, basically with the idea being to ease the recession by increasing liquidity. The reasoning is simple. It is politically unpopular for the ruling class to have unemployed poor citizens. This can lead to contempt for leadership and instability. Therefore, there is always the game of placating the public with false security in order to avoid the truth coming out about the inherent dysfunctionality of the monetary system itself. The result of this easing of the contraction simply delays the inevitable, and since the U.S. government has eased virtually every contraction period since the Great Depression by infusing more money into the system, a doomsday scenario likely awaits. The big contraction. And it might be happening right now.